half in the bag. When's my next review? Oh boy, that took a while to clean up that bloody dead body. Did a real good job washing the floor, Jay. There's almost no blood stains. I didn't exactly wash the floor. How'd you get the blood out? You licked it up? Is that what you're saying? I didn't say that, you said that. Oh. I implied it, there's oh. a difference. Oh, okay. All I know is that if somebody put a black light on this room, they would be blinded by the results. It would be almost apocalyptic in nature. The brightness of how everything would light up from blood stains to semen stains to fecal matter, urine, bodily fluids. Well, those last three are mostly plinket. But yeah. Mostly. Hey, speaking of apocalyptic, have you seen Mother's Day? Oh my God, I have. Some believe that the first mutant was born thousands of years ago. He was some kind of god. And he's going to rise again. You are all my children, and you're lost because you follow blind leaders. No more false gods. I'm here now. X-Men Apocalypse is another X-Men movie about Professor X and Magneto not really agreeing with each other, Mystique being a loner misfit who does the right thing, and the rest of them learning to work as a team or something. Oscar Isaac is back with his greatest acting role since Poe Dameron as the titular villain Apocalypse, an ancient, all-powerful, godlike mutant. Apocalypse wants to do something bad. I'm not quite sure what, but it's up to the X-Men to stop him. X-Men, look out, it's Apocalypse. Jay, what did you think of Apocalypse Now? Oh, that's a great movie. Jay, what did you think of X-Men Apocalypse? Uh, why did it take him two and a half hours just to explain why Xavier is bald? That's pretty much all that you get out of this movie dramatically. It's an okay movie. I liked some of it and I didn't like other things in it. Uh, and it's kind of a, it's like a constant clash of like hoity, more serious, uh, end of the world threats, uh, more dramatic superhero stuff, and complete schlock. Sometimes that actually melds together in a way that's sort of interesting and kind of neat, because it's, it's, it's daring in a way, but then other times it's just like button heads. Well, Jay, I thought this was the best X-Men film since Wolverine Origin. <laughs> How did I know you were gonna say that? <laughs> First of all, I loved it. Uh, I loved it in a way where Brian Singer thought he was making something dark and serious and it turned out to be the schlock that I love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's some unintentional laughs in this movie. Brian Singer is such a weird, he makes such weird decisions where it's like you can call them bold, going all the way back to the first X-Men movie. From the first scene in your first X-Men movie, this big comic book action movie is set in fucking Auschwitz. Like, that's bold, and that never worked for me. I always thought that was, like, borderline tasteless. And they bring it back in this. But he took the fact that he takes chances like that, even if sometimes he falls on his face, is sort of interesting to me. In a way where something like Civil War, these Marvel movies, aren't. Mm -hmm. Even though I like a lot of, I like, I think Civil War is a better movie. If you're just looking at the big picture, like, it's a better movie. I was more entertained by this. Uh, it, it, it was a darn good attempt at doing a live-action apocalypse. Uh, kind of a goofy, weird, all-powerful character that's hard to do. You presume to attempt to destroy me, mutant? You shall pay for your hubris right now! I, I don't know much about apocalypse. So. I, I, well, I mean, you know, I don't know that much either other than the the very basics and what I got from the cartoon show. He's a very ancient, all-powerful mutant and nobody could stop him and he's like the biggest, baddest threat. I cannot be defeated! I thought Oscar Isaac was really good in the role. He was scary to me. He was a really interesting villain. Uh, I, 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 liked, I liked that. It wasn't Guy Wants Revenge. 
he was just like so, I mean, his, his motivation or what he was trying to do, I had no idea. That's why he didn't work for me. <laughs> but the character itself, like just his presence. His, his and performance his like was fine. Performance, presence, uh, the look, like, it was just like, like. He would have been more intimidating though if I knew what the fuck he wanted. Oh yeah. To, they, to, they, to cleanse the earth, I guess, but then what? Well, we can get into that. That, <laughs> that uh, uh, everything wrong with is gonna have a field day with this one. <laughs> um, but yeah, like we'll get into his motivations in a little bit. I'm just, we're just talking surface level here. Well, speaking of surface level, visually, when people started seeing pictures of him in this role, they kept saying he looked like Ivan Ooze from the first Power Rangers movie. But watching the movie, he reminded me of, do you remember the Wishmaster? Do you remember that movie from the late 90s? I, I remember the name. He looks, he looks like Wishmaster. Uh, would, would Apocalypse have worked better as a uh, like a CG villain, kind of like a, an Ultron type thing. Cause oh, I don't know. Always, I, I, I like that there's an actor there. I think yeah. I think Isaac, Oscar Isaac is fine in the, the role. Yeah. My biggest problem is just, yeah, what the hell does he want? And that's why most of the apocalypse stuff in the movie fell flat for me. Together, we will cleanse the earth for the strongest. Each generation has cried out for a new world. But has built the same old one, corrupt and weak. But the new world shall come to pass. I will purge the earth of these benighted humans. That and especially at the beginning, you know, we start in, uh, you know, Egypt, what was the year? Um, whatever. 3000 BC. Whatever it is, but we see his the four horsemen, his disciples, mm -hmm. and they're like cult-like, like they, they worship him, they love him. Uh, they're they're devoted to him and then apocalypse shows back up in the 80s and he's just like hey you you want to be one of the horsemen and they're like okay yeah he needs some more <laughs> and then they all are just horsemen for no real good reason well the storm one made sense Every so, storm was really well developed in this i yeah. liked her a lot i liked that actress um definitely better than halle berry yeah. Halle Remember when Halle Berry tried to do an accent in the first movie, and then by the second one, they were like, that was embarrassing. Let's not do that again. At least I've chosen a side. Uh, the storm in this made sense. Uh, and uh, Archangel, Angel, who turns into Archangel when Apocalypse gives him special powers, his character, Ark, no pun intended, made sense. Uh, they see him and uh, Nightcrawler are fighting in the boxing ring, and then they kind of full circle back to that later on and they fight again um and he gets like he's like drunk and you know uh, battered and his wing is damaged right. and and so he can't fly anymore and he's all pissed off and angry uh and storm is poor uh and has to steal to survive so she has some motivation and of course the big motivation is uh magneto which is all very well set up very emotionally done uh, tastefully, albeit a little dark. Yes, in a way that works. Like I was saying about Brian Singer taking chances. That's one that works. They don't all work, but that one does. Yeah, and then of course we come to the fourth horseman of the apocalypse. Uh, My favorite character in the movie. Yeah, a apocalypse and storm come into the, the, the workshop of the guy who smuggles mutants out of uh, somewhere. And they're like, hey, we want powerful mutants. And then like, uh, Psylocke comes out of the background and he's like, yeah, yeah, I guess you. <laughs> and uh, Psylocke is, of course, played by Olivia Munn. Yes. As we know in Wisconsin, Aaron Rodgers' girlfriend, who I don't think says a single fucking word in the entire film. I, I think she says something. Well, I don't remember her talking. Scene, right? Doesn't, when they first meet her. I don't Th remember this her is, talking. This is how great her screen presence is. We can't even remember if she says words. Olivia Munn, more like Olivia Mum. Because she doesn't say anything. You know, she turned down being uh, the girlfriend in Deadpool to be in this movie because she didn't want to play a role uh, where she doesn't really do anything. Instead, she wanted to take on a role where she doesn't really do anything. Yeah, I don't know. It's like, it almost felt like, who else should we have? As yeah. one of the, I mean, maybe those four characters were Apocalypse's horsemen at one point. I think a lot of characters were. Mm -hmm. Even Wolverine at one point. Oh were, that's just like, I don't know, comic book stuff is so complex. Everything has happened at this point, I'm assuming. Um, uh, but uh, it, just, it just felt like, a, who haven't we had in an X-Men movie yet? Yeah. Like, who do people like? Let's put her in there, you know, it just kind of felt like that. Wake 
your ass up because it's time to go beast mode. Uh, okay, spoilers. Are we starting the spoilers? Yeah, why not? Okay. The whole review is going to be spoilers. All right. Uh, in ancient Egypt, Apocalypse had to transfer his consciousness to Oscar Isaac uh, for some reason. I guess to have a younger He's getting body. old, I guess. Yeah, is he what ages, they, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, he looks pretty old. I guess that's what they're implying. I don't think it's explicitly said, but... So people that don't want to live under the rule of apocalypse, like little resistance movement, sets a trap and buries him in rubble. And then, uh, uh, I guess a bunch of Egyptians find the top of his pyramid buried and like worship it in a cult. And Moira McTaggart, covert CIA operative, for no reason tracks them down. And played by Rose Byrne, who uh, the movie. Yeah, where is she from? Uh, she's in Neighbors. Um, she was in Bridesmaids. She's been in a bunch of stuff. Uh, oh, the Insidious movies. She's the wife in the Insidious movies. Oh, okay. Um, but, but she was apparently in X Men First Class. And she left such an impression on us in that movie that I completely forgot she was in it. So she shows up in this movie, and I thought it was like her first appearance ever. And then they remind you that she's in them. And for no real reason, she has her mind wiped, which is ironic because my mind must have been wiped because I didn't remember that she was in the other movie. I, I, I noted the irony, too. It's like, <laughs> Xavier wiped my memory, too? I uh, guess. But I don't remember any of this. I don't remember any of this. And I was like, who's that? That's too long ago because there have been... That, that was... Um, well, it's not just that it's too long ago. It's, a, there's, it's such a convoluted timeline, too, where it's like, it's hard enough to keep up with the main characters. Yeah, because I believe they had Moira McTaggart in the end of X-Men 3. Hello, Moira. Charles. But also, uh, they introduced us to... Angel already in X-Men 3. Yes. Uh, who is a completely different character in a completely same age, but just in a different decade. Yeah. And and so there's lots of other, like, the, you know, two different Jubilees. Well, it also, uh, this movie takes place 10 years after the, the past of Days of Future Past, right? Uh, yes. Which is several years after X-Men First Class. So by now, Beast should be like, in his late 30s or 40s, but he's still like a young dude. There's well, all sorts of pro timeline problems with these movies. Well, that's the thing. It's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mystique is like, I, I think Mystique ages very slowly. That's like, fine. Yeah, because that's Jennifer fine. Lawrence is like, they're like, We're, you're a hero to us. Yeah. 20 years ago when you did that thing, and she's like, they're same age. I'm like, what's what? <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, it's a it's a mess. It's I, a mess. I think X Men uh, uh, Days of Future Pants was uh, supposed to just like wipe the timeline clean and start over, but I think now they're done. Well, then they fucked that up in this one because at the end of Days of Future Past, I remember they they circumvent the whole uh, uh, Wolverine getting sent to the facility with Stryker and all that, where they do test experiments on him. They, they circumvent that from happening, but then he's just there again in this movie. Well, it's, it's, it's like an alternate timeline. Now he, he's still, he's Weapon X now. Right. And Weapon X is uh, uh, Wolverine, and I don't know if this is a comic book or cartoon, but Wolverine was part of a superhero team called Alpha Flight, which was the Canadian version of like the Avengers or the X-Men. Okay. And he and he was basically like their their killing machine. And then he's like, I'm leaving this group. When he when he's stabbing people, does he keep apologizing since they're Canadian? Well, uh, <laughs> that that sequence though with Wolverine was was great. Uh, the most violent. This is one of the most violent PG-13 movies I've seen in a while. Because I remember X Men Two came out and everyone was all excited when there's the the raid on the mansion and he's going down the hallway and he's stabbing people and you're like fuck yeah, but it's like bloodless. And here he's stabbing people and there's blood. You see blood fly against the wall. It's violent in the way that him stabbing people would be, and we've never seen that before in any of these movies. Yeah. It, but then it, it ends on a really bizarre note where they they open the door, all the little teen mutants. And he runs out just in his underwear, and he runs out into the woods, and just holds on this flat shot, and it made me laugh. Forget everything you think you know.
You're not students anymore. You're X-Men. Apocalypse wakes up, and then he's like wandering around in modern day, well, in 1983, Egypt, and he's like, mm, people, I gotta cleanse the earth. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I guess it means just wipe everything out. Yeah. And then, but where, what's, that, what's after that? And then you just relax. And then he just he sits on a beach with yeah. a little, little tiki drink and uh, <laughs> watches the sunset. Uh, but no, he's like, only the strong will be my new followers. So I guess he's just going to wipe out humanity except for the strong ones and then start a new civilization, something like that. But he's all powerful. Like he could turn people into dust or whatever. Do uh, He could manipulate matter yeah. to make things out of anything. Um, he could probably do it all himself, but he needs his uh, a, a horseman because the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And then he also needs, conveniently, Charles Xavier to talk to everyone inside their heads. I guess. Uh, How did he know about any of this? How did he know about Cerebro? Well, no, he didn't. He, well, he, uh, Xavier accidentally discovered him, and then, and then he's like, what's this? You yeah. know, he what kinda, was he going to do before he knew about that? I really don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> He was going to have Magneto fuck around with the Earth's uh, magnetic core and, and trash everything, which is what Magneto starts to do. Yeah. Can we talk about how Magneto uh, is, is, is he's, he's just a guy. He's, he's in hiding in Poland, and he has a wife and a little daughter, and he's like, uh. And then uh, something very bad happens. I don't want to spoil it. And well, then, are we already in spoilers? Ah, uh, whatever. Uh, <laughs> and then he throws a temper tantrum and kills 38 guys, mm -hmm. and then pretty much trashes the entire world, probably killing hundreds of thousands of people. Yes. And then at the end, Charles Xavier is like, good to see you, old friend. <laughs> Sorry, Charles, until our paths meet again. <laughs> By the way, I don't have my helmet on, which prevents you from going into my mind. <laughs> Which is why I wear the fucking helmet. <laughs> and Charles Xavier, the thought never crosses him to incapacitate Magneto forever. <laughs> Charles, you could put him in a coma for the rest of his life. Then you don't have to worry about Magneto. But Mike, they're dear friends. They just they're, don't. They just don't agree. They're dear friends. He, he, he's not going to incapacitate him, even though he's just killed hundreds of thousands of people. Because he was a little mad. Because he was a little mad. A little mad. A little, well, pretty mad. Can we, we're talking about like the things that are funny because they're, they're stupid in this movie. Can we talk about like a good scene uh, when, uh, we're into spoilers I guess, but when Magneto's family gets killed Ooh. and it's really well done. And then because all the, the cops show up and they're like, we don't have any metal on us. We figured out who you are because you saved one guy in an accident exposing yourself, which you probably shouldn't have done. Um, so it's like yeah. I like the fact that he did that. That was really good. The, the whole don't whole they establish that he doesn't need to like wave his arms around to control things though? Because that's how he gets. They figure out that it's that he did something. Is that he's like, Vroom. yeah. I mean, unless it was just very, he had to react very fast. Maybe, but either way, uh, yeah. So the cops don't have any. They have weapons, but they don't have anything metal, so he can't fuck with them. And then they accidentally kill his wife and kid, uh, two at once. They got a twofer, mm -hmm. uh, and then he takes his wife's necklace and just a little metal necklace and just goes whoosh, and it flings around and flies through each of their necks. That's a, that's a really well done scene. And that's why Bride Singer is so frustrating. Like that scene's awesome. And then there's something so stupid and then something awesome will happen again. And then Psylocke shows up. <laughs> and then Psylocke shows up. I would have enjoyed an entire film about Magneto hiding in the shadows. Yeah, And his sure. little family life and being exposed as Magneto and then. Well, that's another thing to point out is that the thing I've liked about the X-Men movies is that they've never been too grand. They're always mostly just a lot of uh, uh, bickering ideologies. Uh, and this one, it goes big, epic, typical summer blockbuster route, um, which didn't work for me because we're seeing all this destruction. You see it in the trailer. You see bridges break apart and all that shit. I don't see a single reaction from a single person. There's no extras in any of that stuff. So you're just seeing it like in these wide shots that are just completely, you know, 
computer generated, and then we cut to a little junkyard set, and that's where everybody's fighting. It, you know, that I, stuff didn't work for me at all. I don't know. I was okay with it. Things. Let's talk about things we liked. Okay. I liked that uh, it didn't revolve around stupid Jennifer Lawrence. Yes. N- not uh, entirely. She, she's in it, you know, quite a bit. Probably more than Mystique would be if it wasn't Jennifer Lawrence. But she's locked into these movies, and she's actually blue naked Mystique for two minutes maybe of the whole movie and then the rest of the time she looks like Jennifer Lawrence. Yeah. But yeah, she, the movie, the plot doesn't revolve around her the way they were kind of starting to go with some of the other ones. Yeah, from the trailers and stuff when at the, the, the movie ends with her um, starting to train the young X-Men in the danger room Yeah. and she's like, you're X-Men and you know, now's your time to fight and, or whatever and I, and I was like, oh no. She's going to be, like, leading them, and we have to work as a team. Like, X-Men 3, I think, did that with uh, Hugh Jackman and Wolverine, where it's like, you, they have to look up to somebody now that yeah. Cyclops is dead. It's got to be you. Like, Wolverine? No. Wolverine would just leave yeah. and go, fuck all y'all. <laughs> but, oh, I'm going to be a leader now, because I'm Hugh Jackman. Me and Halle Berry, we're the big names. Yeah. Jennifer Lawrence is the biggest name in this, so she's going to be the leader and really, she wasn't. And and what was shocking to me was that the kid who played Cyclops and Cyclops started to kind of like take hold as a leader. He was running around with Jean Grey and um, mm-hmm. uh, Nightcrawler, and and he sort of was like kind of starting to take charge. Mm-hmm. And and I liked the fact that they had Cyclops in this. I liked the kid who played him. He did really good. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was st- starting to learn to use his powers, and <laughs> it was great. Mm-hmm. I, I, I've always liked Cyclops. I, he's always sucked in the movies, unfortunately. Well, because but... they, they they push him to the side because he's not as interesting as a Wolverine. Right. He's not as tormented or whatever. And he's not a big star like Halle Berry was at the time. Yes. So. A storm is boring, but it's Halle Berry, so Halle Berry is the big name. And blah, right. Blah, blah, blah. At the end, when they're trying to kill Apocalypse, you know, M- Magneto turns sides and he's like, no, I, I'm going to start throwing all the metal in the world at you. And then, and then Cyclops is just blasting him with this optic blast. Like the heavy hitters are, are pounding on Apocalypse. And then um, Professor X is getting in his mind. And then, uh, and then big ending, which really is throwing continuity out the window. Well, three didn't happen anymore, right? In this timeline, so it doesn't yeah. matter. Yes, so, <laughs> so for those of you who haven't seen X-Men 3, the elder Jean Grey, played by Femke Jensen, uh, has the the power of the phoenix within her yes. and it's and professor xavier works 24 7 to keep it in check in her brain because if it comes out it's the fucking end of the world she can't control it and it's really dangerous uh in this movie a 13 year old girl unleashes the power of the phoenix on uh, apocalypse melts him melts his face off the most powerful mutant ever to exist melts him and then goes all right, everybody, let's go home. <laughs> I guess I'm okay. Yeah. And in the comic books, I th- I think the the Phoenix was a space a space entity that that was able to control Jean Grey because she was powerful enough to contain it. I think. Okay. I, from what I recall, so there's three different versions of the Dark Phoenix. This one, it's now been established that. This girl, is this the girl from uh, Brooklyn? She looks like the girl from Brooklyn. No, it's not. Okay. This is a girl that's on Game of Thrones. Game of what? That, that Game of Thrones, that show with Peter Dinklage and all the, the dicks and boobs everywhere. Oh, is that the show where you see Peter's Dinklage? I know you got a little thing for him. <laughs> oh, I get it. I know you got a little thing for his little thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so now they've established that the X-Men have at their disposal the Phoenix at their will. Yeah, and there's never going to be any conflict in any future movies. Uh, so. Oh no, we've got another villain. Hey, Jean. <laughs> <laughs> Problem solved. Maybe they'll build on it and say she has to learn to contain it or some crap, I don't know. Ex- until she doesn't have to anymore. Yeah. The, the, the funniest part was at the very end when uh, Xavier and Magneto were saying their goodbyes to each other. And Magneto's like, Charles, don't you worry for the day when they will come for you? Doesn't it ever wake you up in the middle of the night? The feeling that someday they'll come for you 
And your children. And I was like, what? Who? Oh, the, the police? <laughs> you just killed Apocalypse. <laughs> and, and Xavier had the right response. He's like, I pity anyone who comes knocking on the door of this school. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, try the Mutant Registration Act. We got the Dark Phoenix. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> we killed Apocalypse. <laughs> Yeah, most indestructible mutant ever. Uh, we're here to serve you a warrant, Prof Professor. <laughs> <laughs> Everything they built will fall. I loved it. I loved watching them fight Apocalypse at the end. It was so bad. It was great. <laughs> It was very comic booky. It was, yes. And that, that's that's why it worked, except for the, the couple minutes where I think I nodded off because it was boring. I think the movie's I, too long. I, I may have been in a in a like a fever dream, but I believe when uh, uh, Xavier goes into Apocalypse's mind and they're in the, the dream world of Xavier Mansion, I think he says, You're in my house now, bitch. <laughs> and he smacks him. Doesn't he say something like that? I think Welcome you're to my that. house. And they start playing that song by Slow Rider. Oh, yeah, that was a great Welcome scene. Welcome to <laughs> my house. Uh, they, the X Men have to pull on all their powers without really um, doing the whole stupid we have to work as a team thing. They don't have that speech or anything. Yeah. They just all start doing it. It's just they, everybody using their power. They just they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. They just have to stop this guy because he's really fucking dangerous. Mm -hmm. And he's gonna transfer his consciousness into Xavier because the only power that he doesn't possess is getting into every human's mind on Earth. And and I think he wanted to do that. I don't know why. If it was to like cleanse the earth. Well, if it was uh, if it was to like mind control everyone to like like walk into the ocean and kill themselves or to like uh, like worship him like I'm just going to control everyone's mind and make them worship me like God that would have been like understandable or yeah. simple yeah no he seemed to just want to kill everybody yeah let's go to war. And when Cyclops got, uh, got loose, Apocalypse melded him into a wall. And then he's like, ah, I can't take my glasses off. And it looked like everyone was losing. And then Xavier gets the upper hand. Beast breaks him out of the wall. And he's like, whoosh, whoosh, rips his glasses off. He's like, him and Magneto are teaming up and they're fighting them. Uh, it was so bad. <laughs> Then there was that awesome scene when um, uh, Quicksilver comes out of nowhere and starts kicking Apocalypse's ass. Oh, and that yeah. was so awesome. <laughs> and I'm like, he, this isn't going to last for too long. And then Apocalypse is like, I figured you out. Yeah. And he breaks his leg. Now, Apocalypse really would have just went dust. Sure. But eh, it's Evan, uh, Evan Peters. Well, he's the fan favorite because he's, he's great in these movies. Evan Peters is, is great in everything he's in. What else has he been in? Uh, well, he's in all, all the seasons of American Horror Story. That's right. Uh, he's been in lots of stuff. Uh, he was actually Michael Scott's nephew on The Office, one of his very early performances. Uh, remember when Michael Scott uh, publicly uh, spanks him? In the oh, office? that was him, okay. Yeah, he's, he's like all over the place. <laughs> but uh, uh, American Horror Story Hotel, the one with Lady Gaga, he plays the ghost of a 1930s serial killer. Okay. Like uh, it's a it's a it's an ape on H. H. Holmes. You, you, yeah. you know who that is? Oh yeah. He he does this great like ah look here I'm H. H. Holmes. <laughs> Might I suggest that when you murder him you do so off the property? It'd be damned awkward to keep running into him for all eternity. There's the fun uh, sequence, which also tonally doesn't match anything else in the movie. That's what I wanted to mention. That's the, the, the ultimate clash of tones is the Quicksilver scene in a way that is so bizarre that it worked for me. Because this is, um, uh, if you've seen the movie, we're talking about, of course, the scene where he comes to save the, all, the, all the people at the mansion because the mansion is in mid-explosion. The whole place is being leveled. This should be the dramatic low point for our heroes in, in story structure. This is their low point but they turn it into this wacky fun sequence set to the Eurythmics where he's goofing around and saving everybody. And it's so bizarre. Well, yeah, it, it, it <laughs> the, from, the uh, tone is so fucked up. 
And why again was Moira McTaggart in the whole movie? I don't know. Moira McTaggart? More like Moira McTagalong. You're just full of them today. You're just full of them puns. I know Brian Singer was excited to work with James McAvoy. Why do you say that? Well, he originally thought his last name was James McAvoy. And, and he's like, hey, we got a lot in common. Oh, 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 sorry. And it was nice to see Michael Fassbender, who we will, uh, if you've seen the movie Shame, he's known as Michael Fassbender over. Overall, I, I enjoyed watching it. Um, and, it, and it achieved such level of schlock. When I saw it had a 48% Rotten Tomatoes score, I either thought, I'm gonna love this, or it's gonna be a miserable Man of Steel-esque experience. I, I was worried that it would fall more on the Man of Steel side, because you see the trailer, you see the, the cities being torn apart, and I was just like, oh no. Yeah, but there- And the idea that it was like a villain of the week type movie, which the X-Men movies have, up until this point, basically avoided. So I was worried about those things, and those are the things that are the weakest parts of the movie for me. Yeah. Basically everything with Apocalypse fell flat for me, except for Oscar Isaac's actual performance. Mm -hmm. um, but like the best of the X-Men movies, there's good character stuff. Um, I like Nightcrawler a lot in this. I thought he was good. Mm -hmm. He was running around in a Michael Jackson thriller jacket for half the movie. That was fun. The, uh, the jab at X-Men 3 was, was good. In a scene that exists solely to have a jab at X-Men 3. It's, it's like one shot. You see the billboard that says Return of the Jedi, pans down, they're talking about the series, and they're like, well, we can all agree the third one's always the worst. And then they look right at the camera. And then they superimpose an image of Brett Ratner. Yeah. I thought that was a little too much, but... Well, they pan by and Brett Ratner's just, like, sleeping on the street with, like, a face <laughs> bottle. That would have been great, actually. <laughs> he would have done But that shot it. does not need to be in the movie at all. It doesn't, it doesn't serve any sort of narrative purpose other than to take a jab at X-Men 3. Yeah. I mean, it was Brian Singer showing off. I'm sure he, uh, he's got the, like, the... Oh, yeah. You know, thing going on after... Uh, well, that's what makes this movie so unintentionally funny, Ex is that he yeah. thinks he's making a serious movie. Yeah, that, that's what makes it work. <laughs> it is, it is much like X-Men Origins Wolverine, you know, you, you're trying, and uh, I, I like, a, uh, that's why I enjoyed this more than Civil War, because Civil War was just like, uh, I like the, the, the fight sequence in the airport. I thought that was fun comic book schlock. <laughs> But then the rest of it was just like everyone hates each other, wants to punch each other. And this, uh, I, thought, I thought the dramatic elements, like I said before, Civil War I think is a much better movie, but this was more entertaining because of how silly and weird it got. Mm -hmm. I like uh, James McAvoy and Michael Fassbender together. Of course. Their chemistry is great. I wish they were in the movie more. They're mm -hmm. in it for, I don't know, a couple minutes and that's kind of it. That's always been the strongest stuff in any of these movies, whether it's them or whether it's uh, those two old guys. Oh, yeah, Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart. Is that their names? Have they yeah. done anything else? They've been in some things. Mm. Offhand, I can't recall what. Okay. Some kind of like bigger sci-fi series or series of films. Oh, sci-fi. Uh, uh, Patrick Stewart was in Life Force. Yes. <laughs> Where he was possessed by the spirit of a space vampire, what lady, and then he kissed a dude. Yes, that's what I'm that's talking about. That's what you're talking about. about. Okay. Yeah. So, Mike, would you recommend X-Men Apocalypto? I would absolutely re recommend it. I loved it <laughs> so much. <laughs> and Brian Singer hit a home run. Accidentally. For the most part. At least for me only. I'm I was going to say, yeah, you're talking about it from a very specific point of view. If you were to look at this from like a general audience that wants to see like a good action comic book movie, like it's harder to recommend this, I think. Well, I don't know. I don't know. You get your money's worth. It's two and a half hours long. It's There's too long. Of... That's my biggest problem with it, it. But it doesn't feel like, it feels like all the characters were given their, their appropriate amount of time. I think, I think it didn't feel two and a half hours long. And in the beginning it did a little because they were t really taking their time and they're really setting things up. I think if it was cut shorter, it would have felt more rushed and it would have felt like, who's this character? Why is this jumbled in there? But it was because it took so long to do everything. 
all the characters that are in this movie didn't feel like jammed in or shoved in there. And, yeah. You know. Yeah. Everybody's given the right amount of time. I, I thought there was maybe a little too much time spent on exposition of Apocalypse. Yes. Like there's that in scene the in the office with Rose Byrne, who's normally a good actress, and I thought she was terrible in this movie, but she's explaining the whole apocalypse thing, and it just kind of keeps going. Yeah. Well, the, the beginning, too, when they're doing the ceremony yeah. and stuff, that, that went on a little too long. But what about you? Did you um, say anything yet about this? I, as far as if I would recommend it or not? Yeah. Um, I would, kind of, kind of with an asterisk, kind of like what you're saying, where it's schlock, and you kind of have to go in. If you want to see a solid follow-up, Today's a Future Past, because that was a solid movie. Good movie. This isn't really that. This is, it sort of devolves into schlock. So people that want to see a good movie might be disappointed. Or want to see a good, solid, series X-Men movie might be disappointed. Uh, it, it falls on its face just enough to make it entertaining. <laughs> That should be the that should be on the poster. Yeah. yeah. Like twenty percent. Twenty percent fall down ratio. And that's 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 what I want. And Oscar Isaac is great in it. I feel bad for him getting those giant checks. Now he's caught up in the Hollywood machine. He had such the great... Hollywood X uh, machinima. I was seeing that Oscar Isaac. Oscar Isaac gave such great performances in many, many films. But now he's, he's a, sh a schlock clown. <laughs> <laughs> Poe Dameron, oh my God, what a performance. Well, Oscar Isaac ain't Poe no more. Oh! He's making those Hollywood That checks. was a class A pun, Jay. <laughs> I was bound to do one eventually, I guess. That was real good. It that only was, took six years. That was real good. I'm real proud of you. <laughs> well, thank you for watching my show. <laughs>